Hello, my friends. I'm glad to see you all have made it here today because, as always, we have gathered here in the name of Jesus Christ. Let us open with a prayer. Gracious Father, we know you are here today. So we ask that you would speak to us and through us. You would guide us onto a path of everlasting righteousness. We pray for your love and your mercies. We pray that you would move into the hearts and minds of those who struggle to believe in you, who are struggling with the pains and the sufferings of all those things that come with being human. Heal us of our sicknesses. Free us from our doubts. Most of all, deliver us from our fears. In Jesus' name, amen. So today, I want to talk a little bit about how there are a lot of preachers, there's a lot of people out there who have convinced themselves that you cannot preach the true gospel unless you preach hell. If you, can, if you don't believe in God, you must believe in hell. And you can't believe in God without believing in hell. Well, today I want to speak the real gospel. See, here at our Father's House of Prayer, we preach Jesus Christ. We preach God. We don't preach hell because Hell is dealing with punishment. Hell is dealing with doubt and unbelief. And it's not God who's punishing anyone. It is us, the unbeliever. It is us, the person of doubt, who is punishing ourselves. Evidence we're being punished is our own angers, our own frustrations, our own willingness to not surrender. That's the punishment of unbelief. And so I want to remind you today of the true gospel. We've got to ask the biggest question of all time. What is the biggest question? Is Jesus Christ the Word of God? Who is Jesus? Is He the Word of God? Is He God in flesh? Is every word Jesus Christ speak of God? And if it is, the answer is either yes or no to that question. There is no in-between. It is either black or it is white. It is darkness or it is the light. It is either a lie or it is the truth. It is a yes or no question, and there is nothing in between. Either you believe it or you don't believe it. And with the belief comes evidence. People who are agnostics or atheists or out there and say that God can't be proven, they just deny and they reject the evidence given. Evidence does come because with belief comes God in our presence. And it is evident that he's there. It is without denial. And there's millions of people who know of this relationship they have with God. So if Jesus is the word of God, is God, and everything he speaks is of God, would God, would Jesus, ask you to do something he himself refuses to do? Does Jesus come into the world to show us a living example and then not live by that example? Does he preach to us a message that he himself refuses to obey. 
That's, that's the question. And yet it is Jesus Christ who says, I want you to be like me. Follow me. He says, if you love me, you will obey me. And you will be able to do everything I do. So he is saying, I leave with you a living example. And I want you to follow it. I want you to be like me. And then he, he demonstrates the power of God through faith. Washing the disciples' feet. Says, do this for your family and your friends. Why don't we do this for our family and friends? We don't believe. With it comes a blessing. And then Jesus says, this is how I show the living example. I practice what I preach. That's something we struggle with, right? I mean, let's be honest. Jesus says, love your enemies. Jesus says, pray for those who persecute you. Jesus says, bless and do not curse. Do not repay evil for evil. He says, if you love only those who love you, what have you gained? Sinners do that. Pagans do that. Everybody does that. Everybody loves those who loves them back. That's the way, right? What have you gained? What makes you different or better than anyone else? If you lend, and you lend only to those who are going to pay you back, what good have you done? Everybody does that, right? A bank doesn't lend money to just anybody, but only to the people they know are going to pay them back. And we do the same. We don't just go around giving our money away, especially knowing they ain't going to pay us back. So when we talk about hell and say that we can't speak about the true gospel without preaching about hell, why? You're still living in unbelief is my, is my question. And why are you listening to somebody teach you a message they themselves don't even believe in? They don't believe in it. Because Christ does what he says he's going to do. So he says, I am that I am. I am what I am. And that, that is what separates us from him. And, and saying I am what I am is, I am not created by you. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are different than your ways. If hell exists, Jesus Christ is a lie. Because hell, as according to some people, is a place where unbelievers spend all of eternity in a place of being tormented, in a fiery pain that can never be quenched. But how can that be? And this is what the gospel says. Let us go through some of this. Isaiah 43, verse 25 says this. I, yes, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remember your sins no more. God speaking. This is, this is what Christ has done, this is what Christ is doing, and he did it before the foundation of the world had ever been laid. It just it was manifested in a time when we could see it and understand it. Jeremiah 31, 34 says this, 
No longer will each man teach his neighbor or his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they all will know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will, re re I will forgive their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Isaiah says it, Jeremiah says it, Ezekiel says it. Jeremiah 50, 20 says this, In those days at that time, declares the Lord, a search will be made for Israel's guilt, but there will be none. And for Judah's sins, but they will not be found. For I will, re I will forgive the remnant I preserve. So again, it's God's choice. We didn't choose God. God chose us. Micah 7.18 says this. Who is a God like you? who pardons iniquity and passes over the transgressions of the remnant of his inheritance? Who does not retain his anger forever because he delights in loving devotion? So when people say hell is made for the unbeliever, the sinner the doubter, for everybody who's not like me. <laughs> I mean, thank God. <coughs> I come to the altar and I pay a tenth of my tithes. <clears throat> I bring a tenth of everything I got and all my produces or all I can produce. I offer my life to the Lord. Thank God. I'm not like that guy. That tax collector, that sinner. That's when people preach that they must preach hell in order to preach the gospel. That's who, that's the guy. Thank God I'm not like you. Gonna rot in hell forever. And they're always talking about the very people Jesus died for. Jesus came and reconciles the unbeliever, the ungodly to himself by demonstrating his love for them that while they were the enemies of God, he dies for them. He forgives their sin. He atones for their sin. Pays the, the penalty and the price for their sin. When Jesus is hanging on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not who, what they're doing, who is he talking about? Is he not talking about the very people who are screaming at him and, and mocking him and making fun of him and pulling out his beard, actively participating in his crucifixion? Isn't it them he's speaking of? And if every word Christ asks or says, doesn't God listen? Doesn't God respond? Doesn't God answer that prayer, that request? Doesn't listen to the prayers of sinners, but of the righteous, of the faithful. And so Jesus demonstrates his love for the ungodly, a people with no God. See, one of the things about, about that, that whole thing of the crucifixion and how Jesus says, you know, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness and everyone who had been bitten by the snakes and, and were filled with poison, all they had to do was simply look upon that snake head, the bronze snake head that was on the pole, and they were instantly, miraculously healed. So what is that? We, we, we're, we're looking upon Satan. Satan is the serpent. What, what, what 
what actually healed them. Looking upon that? No, obeying God, their obedience to God's command. And how did they, they recognize God's command? Well, first, they, they had to recognize the deception they had been believing in. And the deception they had been believing in was in the devil's message. They were worshiping Satan. And, and how we know they were worshiping Satan, the very people who said, we're chosen by God, we're special, we're holy. If anybody on earth loves the only living God, we are those people sat there and crucified God in flesh. Here Jesus Christ comes to them in an image created by God to represent him. I have created you in my very image. Here he comes in the image God created by the name God had given him. Do you really love God? Because this is the number one law and rule of God. You should have no other gods before me. You will love God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, your strength, your soul. And you shall not murder. And here he is. Hey guys, here I am. Let's kill him. Let's crucify him. And in it, and then seeing him on the cross, what they should have saw, and this is why Catholics have a crucifix, you're sad. What's your sin? You're worshiping and listening to the devil. Because the devil is a murderer. And every student fully trained would be just like their father. There's no mercy in Satan. He kills, he steals, and he destroys. And those who follow after him do exactly what he does. And Jesus says the same, father like son. If you love God, you're certainly not going to go walking around murdering the innocent. That's why we have an empty cross. Because he's alive, we live. We're, we're able to recognize and see that in the murdering of anyone, and I know people say, oh, we can't murder the innocent or kill the innocent. God says you shall not kill man, human being, because man has been made in the image of God. Now, if God says don't murder, why, what would make you think that God so desires to put you into a, an eternal fire where there's no quenching of it, to torture you. Think about this. Does it even make sense that if I come in and say, you know, hey guys, I, I'm Savior. I, I came in here to save you today, right? I saw you were, you were stuck in, in the mud and I saw the chains that you had around your wrists and your ankles and everything binding you there in prison. And I, I got the key right here. Now I'm gonna unlock that key. I'm gonna let you out of prison. I don't believe you. All right, you don't believe me. Then now, all right, I'm gonna, gonna just stomp you down into the ground and I'm gonna beat you and I'm gonna torment you forever and ever and ever because you didn't believe I loved you. It, it, does that make sense? Or is that called hypocrisy? I say one thing, but my actions prove otherwise. Is that hypocrisy? Think about it. Or is it the truth, as Jesus says, I am the truth, the way, and the life. And no one comes to the Father unless they come through me. Because faith is a gift from God. Faith in God's grace. We, we believe in the love of God that came through Jesus Christ. That means that's not a work of our own. And 
God says it is my very spirit that I have placed within you that gives you the power and the ability to cry out, Abba, Father. That's the, the spirit of my son. Not even a work of your own. And I do these things so you do not perish. You are not destroyed. Now, if Jesus comes into the world to save it, and we don't believe it, does that mean it's not the truth? No. It's the truth because the word of God is irrevocable. It stands forever. And if God declares it, then that's what it is. You can believe it or you can not believe it. But that doesn't mean it's the truth. That's why, why God reigns on both the ungrateful and the grateful, the unjust, the just, the righteous, and the unrighteous, all alike. He gives life to all without asking anything in return. What are you if you love only those who love you? What have you gained? And so Christ is, is asking us to be like him. And what did Christ do uh, about the sins of the world? He atoned for them by forgiving them. Micah 7, 19 says this. He will again have compassion on us. He will vanish or vanquish our iniquities. You will cast out all our sins into the depths of the sea. That's, that's, that's the lake of fire spoken of there in the book of Revelation. Sin, the deceiver, the devil himself, the antichrist and the prophet and the beast and everything, that sin and everything that causes sin it is thrown into that lake of fire to where it can't be seen no more. Death and hell are thrown into that fire because death is the deceiver. Because the wages of sin are death. Romans 11.27 says, And this is my covenant that I will make with them. I will take away their sins. See, see, this is the work of God. And, and whose sins are is, is he taking away? Whose sins are he washing away? Whose iniquities is he cleaning up? Whose transgressions is he forgiving? The ungodly, the wicked, the unbeliever, those who have been blinded by the devil. The devil blinds them so they cannot see and not be saved. But God is far more powerful than the devil. Hebrews 10 says this, and then he adds, Their sins and their lawless acts I will remember no more. Before the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, just like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day I took them by hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant. So I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts. I'll write them on the tablet of their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor, and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me. Everyone, all of mankind, shall know me. So I, in the book of Romans, Paul says, every knee shall bow. Every 
tongue shall confess. Jesus is a deliverer. Jesus is the Savior. And everybody is going to know God for who God is. A deliverer. A redeemer. A God full of love. See, see, you can't be love without destroying hell. That's why in the book of Revelations, hell and death, what is the last enemy of Christ? Your unbelief? Your blindness? No, death. Death itself. So he grabs hold of death and hell the wages of sin, anything and everything you should be afraid of, and he throws that into the lake of fire so it is no more. So there's nothing left but the love of God. For I will create a, a new earth and a new heaven. And the former things have passed away. There are no more. Ability to sin is no more. Death is no more. I'll come and I'll wipe away every tear from your eye. Crying and mourning is no more. What is the, generates the crying in the morning? Oh, if you only knew what my son was doing. <laughs> if you only knew what I was doing. And that's the thing, God certainly does know everything that's going on inside the secret places of our hearts and our minds. God is very attentive to the words we never speak. He's listening. He's there. He knows. He is the God who searches the hearts and minds of all mankind, of everyone. And in the book of Revelations, he says, these are the words that are trustworthy and true. It's done. It's finished. I am their God. And I have now made my dwelling place, not in a place separated. See, we see in the book of Revelations, there's heaven and all the heavenly beings. There's God and there's Jesus. There's the lamb that was slain. And then there's earth. And everybody over here. But now we know the two have been made one. No longer a separation. Instead, we are one. God is with us. That's what Isaiah says. God would be known as Emmanuel. God is with us. Christ is with us. In the midst of, of our being an enemy, God is with us. In the midst of our sin, God is with us. And he's demonstrating his love for us that while we were yet sinning, he died for us. Because there's no higher form of love than a friend who gives up his life for his friends. And we ought to do the same for our brothers. When we say our brothers, we're not talking believers. We're, we're talking literally our brothers, humanity, the, the human beings. This is how God extends his grace and his mercy, mercy through us. This is why we want to be like Christ. What, what does Christ have the power and the authority to do. Grab hold of the devil, the deception, the antichrist, the false prophets, and everything that causes sin. And, and he has the power and the ability to cast that into the lake of fire to where it's seen no more. <coughs> Why don't we have that same power? Aren't we one body, one member? In the body of Christ, each and every one of us, one member, even though we're many, we're one member in the body of Christ. And what did the body of Christ 
manifest himself in this world to do, to save it by atoning for the sins, forgiving, forgiving the sins. Hell and death are no more. This is why we can preach the gospel of Jesus Christ without ever mentioning hell. It's no more. I don't believe that, that the unbeliever, the ungodly, the blind, or the handicapped, or, or anyone is going to be thrown into the lake of, of or hell because it, it has been consumed in, in the lake of fire. And we know the all-consuming fire of God is love. Love. So, so, what's stopping us from being like Christ? You know, I had a crazy dream, almost a nightmare. <laughs> and, and if you follow along through some of the videos, I've spoken of this. If you follow me there and me, we in the social media, I've, I've written it down and I kind of made, but, but I had a dream and I think it's all based upon this and it was almost a nightmare because in the dream, one, I started off in a place I hadn't been in a long time. I was, I was placed back in a situation where I wasn't comfortable. I didn't like being there. I didn't like the, the people around me in a job I, I absolutely hated. You know, I, I, I started off this life as building roads for a living and everything you had to do to build those roads. And here I am in, the, in this dream and, and have this brand new rake for concrete, which it's not really a rake, but a thing you use to smooth out the concrete or, you know, when you're pouring concrete. And, and I have this brand new tool. It was in the back of my truck and I saw this guy who I didn't really ever like because he was mean and he was gruff and he was an alcoholic and you know how alcoholics are and you get drunk the night before and every morning until noon you're, you're, you're not feeling well, you're sick, you're recovering from, you know, the night before, the hangover. So you're always angry, you're always upset. Didn't like the guy. And here that guy is stealing my brand new tool and rake right out of my truck. I see him do it, and I kind of don't say nothing at first, thinking, well, maybe he's going to use it for something, but surely he'll put it back sooner or later because it was like morning time. At this time in my dream, it's nighttime and it's dark. Then we're gathering the crew together before we leave the yard. But here this guy is, he puts my tool in the back of his truck and then he's gonna leave the gates and leave the yard and, and go out into the city and do his work or whatever it was he was going to do and had this thought, man, a guy ain't gonna put my tool back. He's stealing it. So I jump in my truck and drive over and Meet him at the gate and, hey man, what are you doing? You stole my tool. No, I, 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 that's mine. No, it's not yours, it's, it's mine. I just bought it, it's brand new. Well, I saw you take it out of my truck. You're caught, you're red-handed. <clears throat> so then we begin arguing back and forth and whose tool it was and blah, 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 and, you know, get into this kind of almost of a heated argument. And, and, and in that dark night sky, all of a sudden there's all these flashes of, of light, kind of like a lightning storm, but these lightning, not lightning bolts that are going from cloud to ground, but maybe cloud to cloud or something, I don't know. There's no sound of, of thunder or anything, just all these flashes in the midst of the darkness. 
And it became noticeable and you're looking and as I'm looking at, at the flashes going on, I also see this, this thing that kind of looks like Casper the Friendly Ghost, a big head with, with a long tail. And I, I say to the guy I'm arguing with, you know, look, it's Casper the Friendly Ghost. It's Casper. That ain't Casper. That's just a white balloon with a long tail. Well, well, it looks like Casper. And, and then all of a sudden, there's lots of them all floating around. And, and as we're looking at it, deciphering, is it Casper the friendly ghost? Are these Casper ghosts or just balloons? All of a sudden, there, we see like flashes uh, uh, of a giant outer space spaceship, alien ship thing, as though it, it's coming out of being cloaked, right? You know, you watch Star Trek and has the cloaking device where it's covered in, in, in the visibility, but and, and now it's coming out and it's flashes visible, flashes invisible, it's visible, it's invisible, and then pretty soon it just is visible. And, and when we see it, and then the enormity of it, how, how huge it is, right? Utter fear enters my heart. I'm, I'm completely afraid. I'm scared. I'm full of, of panic and anxiety. And I'm just like, holy, like, like the sky is falling. Life. It's just all of a sudden coming to an end or something. I, I'm just full of fear. And the guy I'm arguing with jumps in his truck and just drives away. And everybody around sees it. And they're all running and fleeing from it. I jump in my truck and again, I'm going to drive away. But there's this great big loud sound coming from the spaceship. Like this big almost like War of the Worlds, but a different kind of a sound. And the sound waves were so intense that when the sound hit people, or they got themselves underneath the sound wave, they were like incinerated. They just were blown apart into many pieces. And that even made me more afraid and more filled with panic. And I had no idea where to go or even what to do. I was just completely lost and, and oh my God. And you know what? Oh my God wasn't even a thought. There was no thought of God. There was no thought of Jesus. There was no prayer. There was none of that. It was run and hide. So I'm driving down the highway and, and then now it, it becomes light. It's no longer nighttime, it's no longer dark out. It's light, and, and the spaceship is there. And it's driving down the highway, you see off into the distance, the highway is like lined with trees. But the trees looked fake, and they had some kind of a fake coloring about them. You could tell they were fake. And as people were driving down the highway, the trees would come alive and like stand up and they'd run out into the highway and block the highway from people leaving the city as you were at the edge of town, heading out to the country. And then all these people with solid gray suits, these chemical looking suits, I don't know, from head to toe in gray suits, they had black gloves on, these black you know, goggles on and, and couldn't see their face. And I had a, a gray baseball hat on. And they would come right out and grab the people and, and then push the people like underneath that sound wave coming from the ship and they were just all destroyed, consumed, or incinerated right there. You see it all. And then people are screaming and yelling and running to and fro and all over the place. And everybody was in panic. Everybody was afraid. No one was not afraid. It was terrifying. 
because it felt real. Sometimes when I have a dream, it's like an outer body experience. And then when I wake up, it literally feels like I just had to dig myself out of a grave. I don't even feel good. I feel totally sick, beat down, and uh, very, I don't even feel refreshed, redrained. Literally like being resurrected from the death, dead. <laughs> So as I'm seeing these people being gathered up and, and destroyed, and, and that sound is loud, it's pulsating. They just abandon the truck and they get out. And there I look, at, and there's a grocery store, like a King Super Safeway store, a grocery store. So I go running into the store, and again, there, there's people everywhere, and everybody's in panic. Everybody sees it. Everybody knows what's going on. Nobody doesn't know, and they're all afraid. Even inside the store, everybody's running around looking for a hiding place, and that's what I went there. I went to find a hiding place, but there was nowhere good enough to hide, and everywhere I wanted to hide, there somebody was hiding in that place. And it was like, this place ain't even good enough. They're surely gonna find you. So finally, I, I go into the back room and I'm looking for a great hiding spot. See a stairwell. I go down into the stairwell. Down in the, in the bottom where the, all the boiler room and, and the pipes and, and the heaters and, and all that stuff is down in, in the basement. It's kind of dark down in there, but you can still see. And, and again, I have this overwhelming <coughs> feeling and thought there's no place to hide. It's not good enough. This isn't sufficient, and even that, I begin to think, oh, well, now that I'm down in the basement, if they do find me, there's no escape. I have nowhere to go. And then all of a sudden, I find attention to a window. There's this little window down there. I open the window, and I crawl out of the window, back out, and, you know, I'm looking all around, making sure it's safe. None of these alien things or whatever they are, these, these, these stuff going on, nobody can see me. Climb out of the window and again, it's, it's daylight, bright blue sky, everything. Everybody's still in a place of panic. My heart is full of fear. I'm afraid, I'm utterly scared. Never felt really scared like that before. So I, I begin walking through the parking lot of the grocery store, gonna go out and find a better spot to hide. And there I come across this black man, and, and this man is standing there, and I walk right up to him, what are we gonna do? There's no sense in us being enemies. There's, you know, all we can do is help one another. There's nothing left to do. He says, well, I guess, I guess you're right. There's no need for us to fight each other. Let's, let's just go and we'll do whatever we can to help one another. And, and in a way, it was kind of comforting. And so for the rest of the dream, there's me and this guy going around and, and we're trying to find places to hide. And, and everywhere on the roadways where people are driving in their cars, again, you see them being blocked up, the roadways being blocked off by these people dressed in tree suits or whatever it is, these fake trees and people are being carried off and incinerated and everything and still the screaming, the yelling and the panic. Now we're gonna stay away from there so we start walking in the, in the opposite direction and we come to this construction site. And there's something being going on, some sort of construction, not sure what. But there's the trailer there where the, the foremans hang out and the bosses and they read blueprints and stuff, you know, the, the general manager's trailer there at the construction site. And there's a bunch of people kind of mulling around, not an actual line, but they're like waiting in line, waiting for their turn to go into the trailer, and so we're kind of hiding back in the bushes looking, 
seeing what's going on, is it safe, what are, what are they doing? And the guy comes walking out of the trailer with a gun. Not just any gun, he had a nice machine gun. He had kind of like a smile on his face, but he didn't have like a whole bunch of bullets or anything. Probably just the, the bullets that were in the clip or inside the gun and that was it. So it was very limited sense, source of, of protection, if, if at all. But he had a smile on his face. He had some comfort. So we thought to ourselves, oh, th these guys are, are the good guys. They're on our side. Maybe we should go over there and see if we can get a gun of our own. So we mustered up the courage and Together we go over and start asking everybody kind of what's going on and of course they know of the situation. And then when it was our turn to go into the trailer, they're out of guns, they ain't got no more guns. I'm giving them all away. But I really think you guys should grab hold of something that could be a weapon. And there, there was like a little hammer drill, not a full out jackhammer or anything, but this drill like kind of thing and it has a long steel metal point. So I grabbed that hammer drill and I thought, well, I guess I could just ram that into the heart of whoever it was or these aliens or these people dressed in gray suits or whatever it was I had to do to protect myself. I just use that. At least it was something. And then heard the alarm and I woke up. Boy, I was happy to wake up. That was almost like a nightmare. And what made it so nightmarish was the feeling of panic and fear, anxiety. This feeling of utter, absolute hopelessness. Everybody was doing everything they could to survive, and they, there was no option of surrendering because surrender was to die. And that wasn't an option, and yet in all of it, there's this great feeling of utter hopelessness because that was the only option. It was inevitable. No matter what I did, and nothing mattered. Friends didn't matter. Family didn't matter. My job didn't matter. Money didn't matter. It didn't even matter if I was being stolen from. Nothing mattered. Arguing with other people didn't matter. It, it, nothing mattered. The only thing that mattered was not surrendering to death. And it was inevitable. It was hopeless to even try and think of anything else. And so it is. It is exactly as Jesus says it is. Everyone who tries to save their own life will perish. But if you're willing to surrender your life, you will be saved. Jesus is coming, and he's coming with all the hosts of heaven. And even Jesus said, I am like an alien, not of this world. If I was of this world, they would respect me, they would love me, they would care for me, they would attend to my needs. But instead they hated me and they despised me because I wasn't of this world. It's like an alien. Many of the prophets and all the people said, and that great and terrible day when the Lord returns, it'll be just like that. People will run to the mountains and say to the mountains, cover us. They'll run to the hills and they'll say to the hills, bury us. They'll do anything and everything they can to find a hiding spot to preserve their own lives. But they will not surrender to the will of God. And won't surrender to Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is going to grant death and life. And it will all be swallowed up in a single word. 
just as the Bible says, Jesus will come. He'll speak a word with a loud trumpet blast, the last trumpet. And everybody who hears that word will instantly die or vanish or come to life. He will raise up those who have been dead, who have perished. That word is come. Come. It says to the ungodly, to the unbeliever, to the dead, to you and to me, come. Come. Because he is, I am. What I am, I am your deliverer. I am your redeemer. I am the God who loves you. That's why God sends Jesus into the world. At that world, word, the devil and the antichrist, the deception, the false prophet, all of that that has been blinding you will vanish and all that will be left is the eternal word of Jesus Christ which is God's promise what is God's promise I will remember your sins no more come come and live and that's it that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now that you've been baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, you should be able to receive the promised Holy Spirit, which is God coming into your life, coming into your heart, living with you, eating with you, being with you, hanging out with you, allowing you to have a personal relationship with God. You don't need anybody outside of God himself to engage in that relationship. That's why you don't need any teachers or anybody to tell you, know the Lord, because you do know the Lord, and what you know about him is the truth. The truth is the all-consuming fire of God is unconditional love. And that love is yours. It's for you. And just because you reject it, deny it, or refuse to believe in it, doesn't diminish that love, that grace. See, God doesn't say, my love is determined upon your approval. He says, my love is the truth. It is the way and it is the life. And there is no other truth. There is no other way. There is no other life. And it's yours. It's yours. And that's why Paul says, therefore, let us be just like Christ, let us be a living sacrifice. As Christ was a living sacrifice. Just as Jesus forgave your sins, forgive the sins of others. When you see your enemy hungry, feed them. When you see your enemy naked, clothe them. When they're sick, tend to their needs. And don't forget to visit them in prison because everything you did to the least, your enemy, you did it to God. And that's the final judgment. Come, you who are righteous. Come. Because you are willing to forgive 
as I forgave, so that all mankind may experience the mercy of God. Come, says the Lord. And, and in our lives, that's easy to accept. When the doctor diagnoses us with sickness, cancer, whatever it is, it's easy to accept when we're 90 years old, laying on our deathbed, wishing for a day to come to an end. But it's very hard to accept. It's very hard to surrender to. And you're full of vigor. And you're full of life. And you're not sick. And you're strong. And you're willing. And you're ready to engage in all the goodness this life has to offer. It's hard to surrender when you believe. You have something to offer. And you still got a lot of time left. It's hard to surrender and accept when something more powerful than you subjects you to something you absolutely don't want to surrender to. But it doesn't make it the truth. The truth will stand. Every eye will see, and every tongue will confess. Jesus Christ is who he says he is. Let us end with a prayer. Oh, Father, God, we thank you and we love you. We love you for your kingdom. And the power of that kingdom and how we have come to know its dominion will endure forever. So let your kingdom come and dwell with us here on earth just as it does in heaven. Let your will be done. Because today we are surrendered. Father, feed us. Feed us our daily bread. Nourish us. Build us up. Encourage us. Strengthen us. So that we may believe in every promise and truth that you have given to us to believe in. And Father, forgive us for our trespasses, our debts, our sins, our doubts, our unbelief. Forgive us, Father, for our ungodly ways. Because today, we are willing to forgive those who don't believe in us, who refuse to respect us, who tear us down and break us down because of their ungodly ways. We forgive them because we know in our forgiveness, your eternal word is manifested in our hearts and our minds. Lead us away from temptation, from the deception, from the hatred and the anger, so that we all may be delivered from the evil one. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.